Thank you, Father. Utterly trustworthy, absolutely dependable. The rock on which we stand, ancient of days, king of glory, we bow before you. We worship the majesty on high. Covenant maker, covenant keeper. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, for a million things. It will not be enough to thank you. For your covenant over us in this house. For your faithfulness. Blessed be your name. This morning, Father God, we pray that your word will come by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let it be spirit and light. Glorify the same by mighty works in our lives. Please, this morning, Father, heal anyone that is sick. Set captives free. Let signs and wonders be done. All in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Before I left, I started speaking on doing exploits. And I'm still going to press on that because this is our year of great exploits. So I may repeat myself again and again because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, dearly him is not is not um, it's not just uh, a slogan. It's not a slogan. It's actually what the spirit of God has revealed and what God wants to do in our lives. It's not a slogan that at the beginning of the year we just say and then everybody goes his own way to go and live his life anyhow. A theme given to us by God is a prophetic word to channel our path through the year. And everybody must be deliberate about it, ensuring that our lives are patterned along the line of what God has revealed. If God says this is a year of exploit, you must your heart must be fixed on doing exploits in all areas of life. So again and again through the year, I may remind you, speak to you, re-emphasize the issue of doing exploits. Let's go to our team test for the year, which is Daniel 11.32 this morning. Daniel 11.32. Those who do wickedly against the covenant shall, shall he corrupt with flattery. And the emphasis, but the people who do know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploit. Not just exploit, great exploits. And we define the exploit as notable, memorable, Heroic act. Notable, memorable, heroic act. Something notable, something that will be historic, something that your history will not be complete without. Must happen in your life, through your life this year. Something unforgettable must happen and they will happen in every life especially those who are applying their heart unto what God has said things actions that produce outstanding results this year your life must produce outstanding results and it will in the name of Jesus. So this year we must know that God has called you to do something special. Or you must know that God wants to do something special in your life. You must have that sense. 
that awareness. You must carry that awareness. That God wants to do something special in my life this year. Something outstanding. Something unforgettable. Something that will be historic. It's going to happen through my life. Through my family. Through our church. This year. Can I hear your amen? amen. And I said it's going to require God's ability plus your responsibility. It's not that we're going to fold our arms and say, oh, God is going to do something spectacular. I don't have to do anything. No. God doesn't want you to be a casual player in the issue of your life and destiny. He wants you to participate. You must put your responsibility in place. And when your responsibility meets God's ability, then there will be possibility. So, you must be prepared to take some massive actions this year. Massive, focused, congruent actions. There are things God will require you to do and to do diligently and to do with all your heart. This is not a year of slack hands. This is not a year of idleness. This is not a year of folding hands. Whatsoever your hands find to do, you do it with all your heart. Hallelujah. So I also give us five things, uh, consistent parts that will lead us to exploit. I said, number one, you must know what you want. You are, what is the outcome? You must define the outcome you want out of your life. You must have a vision which you should receive which you should have received or you should receive in the place of prayer, you know, while you are praying to God. God will lay it in your heart. God will put it in your mind. All right? So you need to know what God is saying to you personally. He has said to us generally, but what is he saying to you specifically? Then number two, whatever God says, I say it's always bigger than you. You must believe that it can be achieved. You don't look at the magnitude of it because it's not your own strength. It's not in your own wisdom. It's not in your own ability. What God wants to do through you is going to happen through the ability of God. God just needs your cooperation to put some things in place and God will accomplish it. You, you must believe that whatever dream God is putting in your heart, whatever plans God is placing in your heart is achievable. You can achieve it. You must believe. Faith must be in place. Number three, you must then take necessary actions. You must take necessary actions. Action will take you just beyond dreaming, beyond uh, desire. Until you take actions, your dream is meaningless. Until you do something. And then, with number four, I said you must censor your actions. Know which one is getting you closer or which one is moving you away. And then you have to review and uh, improve on those that's moving you towards your desire. Change those that are moving you away. So you must, be, and which is number five, be flexible enough to change your actions till you get what is working. If you try something and it's not working, then try something else. Some people give up when they take action and something is not working. No, when God has placed the dream in your heart, it will work. It has to work. So if the action you are taking is not working, it means you've got to change it. Until, and you keep adjusting until you find what works. Hallelujah. And we said, the power of God is mightily at work in our lives. We began to also look at the example of Daniel as a biblical poster of exploits. Someone who began his exploit as a slave, a captive from Israel to Babylon, and who as a slave in a strange, hidden 
land where he was despised. Daniel became elevated to the second highest position. Not in the midst of his friends, in the midst of vile, terrible enemies, his haters. And how did he do it? His devotion to God in prayer, his devotion to God in the study of God's word, his lifetime of intimate, unbroken fellowship with God was what built strong faith, courage, stability of character into him. And that was how Daniel prevailed. So we began to look at a few things observable in the life of Daniel that made it possible for him to do such great exploits. And if we can replicate those things, we will do the same and even much more. So we looked at the first one, which is intimacy. Intimacy with God. This is where everything steps up from. That's where it stems from. Daniel had intimacy with God in the place of prayer. It was a discipline, nothing, not even the law of the country could take away from him. It's very easy to be diverted, especially in this time. But you must know that this is the core of your life. This is the center of your life. This is where your life is incubated. And that once you don't get it right there, you may not get it right anywhere else. It is through God, intimacy with God, that Daniel possessed that capacity that made him to do exploits. Daniel was equipped by God spiritually. And he had the spirit of God which, which enabled him to interpret the dream of the kings and to solve the problem of the nation and to become elevated. The second thing we looked at is love. Love. Love is the law on which every other thing functions. Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And thy neighbor as thyself. Say, on these two commandments, on the commandment to love, functions all other laws. The law of faith, the law of prosperity, whatever law. They function on the law of love. So, and the Bible commands us to love one another. Because God is love and he says, everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And anybody who does not love does not know God because God is love. If you say you know God, God is in you, then there must be love in you. If there is no love in you, then there is no God in you. It's empty religion, meaningless religion. If you find it difficult to love, you need to pray for God to reveal himself to you again. Love, we said, is our antidote to greed, selfishness, and loss. Anybody living in lust, and lust is to serve, to satisfy self at the expense of others, which is also selfishness. If your life is around greed, selfishness, and lust, there is no love in you. I've defined love severally. It's more than warm feelings towards someone. Love is to desire the long-term well-being of another and be willing to make the self-sacrifice required to bring it about. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved the gave. If you love, you give. You make self-sacrifice. Love, I said, is the spirit of heaven. Anybody going to heaven must be filled with love. Lost is the spirit of hell. Hallelujah. Then we look at the third one, which is faith. 
faith in God. God is a faith God. He operates by faith. We are created in his image and likeness, so we are to operate by faith. And Mark 11 says we must have the faith of God. Amen? We must have the faith of God. Hallelujah. We saw how Abraham did mighty exploits. How he gave birth to a child when his body was dead and the wound of his wife was already collapsed. Just imagine a woman of 90 giving birth. Those things should happen today. It means a barren woman at the age of 80, 70 has no reason to give up. Because every miracle of the Bible can be replicated. If we believe like Abraham believed, a woman of 60, 70, 80 can still conceive and give birth to a special child that will shake the world. Hallelujah. The Bible says, Abraham was not weak in faith. He considered, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old. And he did not consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But he was strengthened in faith. He was giving glory to God. He was not murmuring and complaining. He was praising God. He was giving glory to God. Because he was fully convinced that what God had promised God is able to do. We quickly give in to murmuring and complaining many times. This year, murmuring and complaining must not find its way into your life in any way. No matter how contradictory the situation is, we must keep giving praise to God. Hallelujah. Everything we see in the world, God brought it forth by faith. And everything we are going to do that God has empowered us to do in this world, we must also do it by faith. And faith is seeing things from God's perspective rather than human perspective. Most of the time, human perspective will tell you that those things God says he wants to do in your life are impossible. Human perspective must have told Abraham, man, forget about this thing. You're too old. Your wife is too old. But he was seeing it from the perspective of God who said, I have made you a father. Hallelujah. And of course, Daniel, our model for this study, was a great man of faith. Faith that was born out of his intimacy with God. It was that faith that made him bold. And his boldness was exhibited in every way. In carrying out his duties among those who hate him. Among those who raise, who raise malice against him. In his public identity with, with Jehovah. You know, he didn't hide his faith. Even when the law was made, nobody must pray well. I'm sorry, I can't help you. That's my life. Many people hide their Christianity today. They are ashamed to let people know where they stand. There are Christians in their office, they don't know they are born again. They hide that identity. Everywhere you are, you must identify that you are a child of God. Of course, if you are not planning to continue to sin, you must let people know where you stand so that they can hold you accountable. They can tell you, but you say you are born again. Praise God. He was bold in facing lion. It is still the victory that overcomes the world. And the word of God says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. So faith is born of God. And that's why the issue of intimacy with God is very important. Fellowship and intimacy is there that your faith is born. It's there that you know God, God is revealed to you. And when God is revealed to you, you will automatically have faith. When God is revealed into your spirit, you will automatically have faith. We looked at three or four things that those recorded in 
Hebrew 11. These are people who did great exploits, which God wants us to replicate. Four things that characterize their lives. Hebrews 11. Four things that characterized their lives. I think verse 13. Oh, we don't have cancer. Can you give me? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, we are assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims or not. These people did great things. All those things that were recorded in the Bible, who received fulfillment of promises, took over strange lands and that became their possession, see their dead race to life, and so on and so forth. And yet, the Bible says, what they receive is not yet the fullness of the promises. But even the much they do, they did. If many will do it today, they will be counted as great people. But what did they do to achieve those things? Number one, they saw the promises. They saw the promises. It's not just physical saying. They saw it in their spirit. They had a revelation of the promise. It's not enough to hear something, but you must have a revelation of it in your spirit. So they saw the promises. That's number one. They saw the promise of God. They had a vision. Number two, the Bible says they were assured of them. They had conviction. They were persuaded of the promises. They had confidence concerning the promises of God. Number three, the Bible says they embraced them. What we call today, they claimed the promises. Hallelujah. They put themselves inside the promises. They saw the promises as belonging to them. They believe what God said is to them. They embraced it. They claimed it. They prayed it. They confessed it. And finally, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They confessed the promise. Let's take note of those four things in walking in faith. Number one, you must catch a revelation of the promise of God. Number two, you must embrace it, claim it, receive it, put yourself in it, see it as yours, be persuaded, have confidence. Number three, they embraced, they own the promise. And number four, they confessed the promise. And when you do this, it will be obvious in your life. It will be obvious in your life. Because when you believe a promise, you won't murmur about or grumble or complain about seeming contradictions. Because you don't see the contradictions. It's the word you are seeing. It's the promise you are seeing. The promise is the picture in your heart, not the physical contradictory evidences. The word is the picture in your heart. That's what you are seeing. So there will be no room for murmuring or complaining. Whatever you are going through doesn't matter. Praise God. If you know 10 million is coming for you tomorrow, but you don't even have the meal for this afternoon, you will joyfully fast. You won't say you don't have food. You say I'm fasting. <laughs> Praise God, because you know tomorrow you can buy any food you want. You know it's coming. So you won't be complaining about today. You won't be going, uh, you won't be going phoning people, I don't have food, oh, I'm dying, you know. You will keep quiet. You will just spend that time praying and thanking God and blessing God because you know by this time tomorrow my life has changed. Hallelujah. So when you truly are walking in faith, it will be evident by your lifestyle.
when you see people murmuring and complaining and grumbling and blaming and they are not walking in faith. And you should walk away from such people. It doesn't matter what title they carry. You can't you can't be a faith person walking in the company of murmurers and complainers. No. So all these people, they are God-given revelation or dream, not their memories consume them. They are God-given revelation, not what they saw, not the physical things consume them. No one can live in this world without belief. Everyone believes in something. And your belief holds the greatest potential for good or for harm in your life. Your belief holds the greatest potential either for good or for harm in your life. What you believe about God holds the potential for life everlasting or death eternal. It is not enough to believe. You must believe the right thing. What you believe shapes your life, shapes your future. Wrong belief is the basis of wrongdoing. You know, criminals believe they can get away. Because if a criminal knows, if I do it, I'll be caught. He won't do it. But he believes I can get away. That's why he does it. They believe they can get away. Drug abusers believe drug will give them good feelings. They don't know it's going to destroy them. A lot of poor people believe they were created to be poor. Nobody was created to be rich. Nobody was created to be poor. It's all about how you act based on the word of God. If you, if you find it and you know how to walk in it, it can change your life. I see people who cannot afford any quality life moving from poverty to extreme prosperity this year. I see, I see people who don't have a job. There's somebody under the sound of my voice this morning. You don't really have a real job. You are just struggling. Before the end of this year, you will employ people. Radical transformation is going to happen to people who are applying their hearts to the word of God. Hallelujah. I don't know if I got there. The next point is, sorry, something just happened now. The next point, I don't know if I got there, is we looked at intimacy, we looked at um, love, we looked at faith. Number four is learning and living by God's principles. Did I speak on that? All right, so that's the next one. Now let me proceed from there. Glory to God. Now, understanding and living by divine principles puts you on the platform of limitless possibilities. Understanding and living by divine principles puts you on the platform of limitless possibilities. Principles guide the operation of this world. This world is built and run on divine principles. And principles properly applied will work for anybody, anywhere. Many people are running from this country because they believe things are bad. A lot of other people out there are coming to this country and they are making a fortune. 
Some people are running away. Others are coming in. And they are making a fortune. And those who run away from here are serving as slaves up there. Just crushing existence. All they make is to run bills. Principles don't change. And they don't fail. Because principles are God set. And because God doesn't fail, the principles that God has set cannot fail. Principles, God, divine principles are as powerful as the source, which is God. Divine principles are laws upon which this world was designed by God to function. Divine principles are laws upon which this world was de uh, designed by God to function. So, kingdom principles are the keys that Jesus said he gave to us to use to bind or lose. That is, if you work in principles, you can allow certain things to happen and you can disallow certain things from happening. If you work in principles, you can disallow poverty in your life and you can allow prosperity in your life. You can disallow defeat in your life and you can allow victory in your life. You can disallow failure in your life and allow success in your life. The key is what God gave to us in divine or kingdom principles. I give unto you the keys of the kingdom, the kingdom principles, and whatsoever you allow on earth shall be allowed in heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What we actually come to church to do is to learn those principles. It's not to, just to hear sermons and go back home. We are to learn those principles and go and properly apply those principles. That was the secret of Daniel. He studied and practiced the word of God, which are divine principles. If you look at his life, for instance, Daniel walked in love. Daniel walked in forgiveness. Studying the love of Daniel, there was no record of him trying to get even with the people who got him into the lion's den. He never cursed them. He never spoke even word about them. There's no record that he was uh, angry at them. Because as far as it's concerned, they are inconsequential. God controls his life. Not them. Not their malice. Not their evil talks. He didn't bother himself about them. He didn't hold a grudge. He never said anything about them. Hallelujah. He faithfully served them, even those who took him captive. Take strong people to forgive in tough situations. That forgiveness is a principle of the kingdom. Unforgiveness is the reason for the suffering of many people, even in the church today. It is tough when your wife is caught in an affair. For many Christians, oh, that's a good reason. Divorce, straight. The Bible says, if it's unfaithful. Divorce is not the first option. Forgiveness is the first option. It's tough to find your wife committed adultery and you forgive. That's Christian. That's Christianity. It's tough when your children are rebellious or trapped in drug. Many parents will cast them out and reject them straight away. Eh? He wants to bring disgrace to my name. Stay there and walk it out on your knees in prayer by your faith. Are you with me? 
God had only two children, Adam and Eve. He lost them to Satan. What did he do? He set out the plan of redemption. He didn't work out on them. And we are to be his followers, imitators. Are you with me? The stone that the builder rejected can become a cornerstone. Hallelujah. Those children that Satan tried to destroy might be prime children sometimes. If there is nothing about them, Satan won't bother about them. So don't give up. Stay there. Yes, you may go through shame, but your shame will turn to glory. Your shame will turn to glory if you stay with God and you lay hold upon the promises of God. Your Lord, you promise, you will save me and my household. Stay there with your children. Forgive them. Hallelujah. I know it's tough. It's tough when your finances are not working and your finances have stopped supporting you. It's tough. Even more so for a pastor. When your supporters say we are no more going to finance you if you keep speaking against those things they do. There are many situations you're going to face. Tough when those you love come against you. Tough when your job is taken. When your family is hungry. And I want to tell you that in tough times, forgiveness can be the key to your breakthrough. In tough times, forgiveness can be the key to your breakthrough. So in tough times, you can be your own best friend or your own best enemy. Well, worst enemy, I should say. You can be your own best friend and worst enemy. You are your best friend when you learn to let go and you forgive. You are your worst enemy when you hold on. You remember he said, the servant who did not forgive, he said, deliver him to the tormentor. So don't give the tormentor a room in your life. By forgiveness, you set yourself free. By unforgiveness, you keep yourself in prison. Forgiveness is a trait of mature Christian character. Forgiveness is a trait of mature Christian character. You cannot claim to be a Christian and you are holding grudge. Days, weeks, months, some even years. You are no more a Christian. You are backslidden. We must be quick to deal with issues and forgive and move on. Because when you hold on to issues, you are holding yourself back. For as long as you are holding to those issues, you are holding yourself. You think you are holding somebody. You are holding. In fact, to hold somebody back, you must stay back to hold the person there. You can't hold somebody back when you have moved forward. So to hold somebody back, you must stay there with them. Tell your neighbor, move forward. Leave those issues and forget them. Move forward. Daniel was also a man of resolve and integrity. He purposed in his heart and would not compromise his faith to worship any other God except Jehovah. He was very courageous. Hallelujah. It was very, very courageous. This year you must be courageous. Glory be to God. One other thing in the life of Daniel, another thing in his life is mercy. He was very merciful. What is mercy? Mercy is not treating people as they deserve. When they do wrong. You must not forget that Christ died for us while we were yes sinners. 
He didn't die for us when we were good. Stop treating people the way they deserve. You know, I know it's a principle of the world. You do me, I do you. Pay people back in their own coins. Imagine God paying you back in your own coins. Will you be where you are? You won't even be alive. Let's learn to show mercy. Even to the undeserving. Because you want to move on with your life. Hallelujah. Then integrity. I'm rushing now. Integrity. What is integrity? To adhere or to hold on to moral and ethical principles. Moral and ethical principles. These things are fast disappearing. Values are fast being lost today in our society. But as believers, we must embrace the values that are revealed in the word of God. We must have soundness of character, honesty, tell the truth as it is. Don't lie, don't manipulate people. Don't exaggerate. Don't minimize the truth. Say it as it is. Integrity. Then we saw in him also generosity. What is generosity? Readiness to give liberally. Liberality in giving. Generosity embraces three things. Number one, freedom from meanness or smallness of mind or character. Meanness, mean. Freedom from meanness or smallness of mind or character. You know, when somebody is very small-minded, every little thing he has, he wants to hold on to it. He magnifies the little he has. It looks so big to him and he wants to cling to it. When somebody is big-minded, he lets go. He easily releases because just say, what's it? That's a little thing. Hallelujah. I read of a friend who lent his car to a friend who got married and the, and the, and the friend crashed the car. And they were so afraid. What are we going to tell our friend who was so kind to us? When they came back and they were told we have bashed the car badly. He said, what's in the car? It's just a, little, it's a piece of metal. Come on, don't worry yourself. It's a piece of metal. Don't worry yourself. That's someone who is large-minded. Glory to God. Who easily let go? Then number two, about generosity. Is, you know, willingness to release. A, uh, willingness to, to let go whatever you have in your hand. Or what I would call largeness of fullness largeness of fullness you see you, you 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 see bigger than what appears and then generosity also is a character of faith i know if i release what's in my hand that which is in god's hand will come amen Oh, minus two. All right, the, the next thing is courage. What is courage? The quality of mind or spirit that enables somebody to face difficulty, danger, pain, without fear. The quality of mind that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, pain, without fear. Bravery. They are going through, you don't even know they are going through. 
Some people, any little thing they are going through, it will appear all over them. All over them. Even little daily challenges that everybody has to, I mean, has to cope with. You will see it all over them. Some people, even if the whole heaven is falling, they raise their head that they are walking tall. They won't have sleepless nights. I don't have sleepless nights over any problem. The only problem that can make me have sleepless nights is if I know my relationship with God is affected. I will not have peace. I may not be able to sleep. But that, that is the challenge. No. I know challenges will give way to chances. I know God is on the throne. I know he said shall die. I know he will intervene. Hallelujah. Daniel was a man of courage. He was very courageous. He took courage to engage in civil disobedience. When you know you stand to lose your position, your power, your prestige, everything else in your life. That was what he stood to lose by taking a stand to continue to pray when the king said no praying. It takes courage to be a real Christian. It takes courage to be a godly person. Courage is a result from the heart and spirit. It takes determination to remain faithful even in the face of threat, to stand for righteousness when others bow to pressure. And that's what makes a man taller than others. Integrity and courage will subdue enmity. May God give us courage in Jesus' name. Finally, let me conclude today. Responsibility. Everybody say responsibility. Man has responsibility on earth. Man is designed to have responsibility on earth. Man is designed to walk. Man is designed to do something. He was created to do good works. Ephesians 2.10. Man was designed to prove himself. So look at your assignment and take responsibility. The Bible says we are his workmanship. Ephesians 2.10. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before time that we should walk in them. So there are good works that God prepared before time that you should walk in them. You should locate them, take responsibility. Jesus was responsible. In John 5, 17, the Bible says, but he answered them, my father walketh here too and I walk. Man, walk. Find something to do. If there is nothing to do, ask for voluntary. Walk. My daughter got her first job by voluntary work. He found a company where he loved what they were doing. So he came home and said, I'm going to work for them free. And we encouraged her to go. And she worked diligently free. Initially, we were the one giving her transport to and fro. Later, when they, see, when they saw how she was working, they started giving her transport. At the end of the time he signed to work for them, he said, I was going to say, you cannot go. We will employ you. They employed her. That was how he got her first job. First she started voluntary. Hallelujah. And that's how she started building her CV. And she's where she is today. So work. Jesus said in, Matt, in John 17 verse 4, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Your assignment is revealed by your creative makeup, your divine design, your passion, by revelation. Whatever God has revealed to you, go and do it. It can also be revealed to you by your abilities, your talents, your gifts, your experiences, your training. That engage. And engage in the specific assignments God has given us. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every Christian. It's the assignment of every Christian. Every one of us must endeavor this year to win one soul a month. 
personally, apart from the ones we do corporately, everyone, we must cultivate and exert all our capacities. We must not be lazy. We must seek the purpose of God and have unrelenting commitment to fulfilling them. The essence of work is to fulfill purpose. Not actually to pay, build, or amass meaningless wealth. It's to fulfill purpose. So let's take responsibility for assignment. Your assignment everywhere. Your assignment to show your assignment in the place of work. Let's take responsibility. Take responsibility in your marriage also. Care for your family. Amen? Care for your family. The relationship between Christ and the church is described as that of marriage. The church being the bride, Jesus being the groom. Jesus is a family man. He loves his bride and laid down his life. So also, we must take responsibility for our family, especially you men. Take responsibility. Jesus did not seek his personal interest. He washed the bride, the church, with the washing of water by the word. Take responsibility as a priest in the home. Lead your wife and children to pray. Provide spiritual covering. You can't provide spiritual covering when you are weak spiritually. And when you create that vacuum and your wife takes over spiritually, you become bitter. There can be no vacuum. If you are not providing spiritual covering for that woman, she has to seek spirituality to save herself from being prone to the wicked. The Bible commands the husband to love their wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Let's make sacrifice for our families, men. The Bible says, so ought men to love their wives at their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Let's love our wives. Cultivate your family. Put your family first after God. Create quality time for your families. Men, provide, protect, project your wives and your family. Provide, protect, project your family. Your wives especially. Resolve conflicts quickly. Don't keep grudges. Amen. Don't, don't spend your family as a price for success in career. Some ignore their family. They spend all the time building a career. When will you enjoy it? What's it all for? They ruin their family. There's, there are success out there, but at home they are failure. You are a total failure if you fail at home. Hallelujah. God will help us. And of course, wives, you have to be submissive to your own husbands. That even if some of them do not obey the word, the Bible says, they without the word will be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct, I'm reading from scripture, accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward Arranging the air wearing gold or putting on fine apparel. Did you know what that scripture said? Did you notice? Do not let your adornment be merely. It didn't say you shouldn't do those things. Don't let your beauty be the beauty that comes as a, as a result of how you arrange your air wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. With the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, not a violent woman. And he says, This is precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also had done themselves. They had done themselves not by the outward beauty or what they wear or what they wore, but being submissive to their husbands. The Bible says, and even Sarah, you know, of, uh, obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And he says, who daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So husband, I mean wives, let's learn to submit to our 
husband and not be rebellious against them. Husbands also we are asked to dwell with our wives with understanding, honoring them as weaker vessels and honoring them as joint ears of the grace of life. May God help us in the name of Jesus. And in all these things, be consistent. It's not, oh, you had the message, you do it one week, next week, you go back. We must be consistent. We must be consistent. We must be diligent in obeying God. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, all these blessings shall follow you. This is a year of exploit. If you will hold on to these principles of the kingdom, you will see great things happen in your life. I've said it, let me repeat myself. There are people here who will not only surprise the world, they will surprise themselves. Amen. This year, may you be one of them. Amen. God is going to move among us in such power and grace that will be outstanding as we position ourselves on the principles of the kingdom. Anything you allow will be allowed. Anything you disallow will be disallowed. Rest us up to pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want you to lift your hand and give glory to the Almighty for his promise that this year great exploits will happen through you. Say, Father, I'm grateful. I receive your word. I believe your word that this year great exploits shall be done through my life. Great exploits shall be done through my life. Thank you, Father. Now ask him, Heavenly Father, make me strong. Make me strong. Help me, Lord God Almighty, to follow the principles of the kingdom. Help me, Lord, to embrace the love, love of faith, of courage, of consistency, of diligence. Help me to line my life up with your word. Father God, strengthen my faith. Pray. And ask him, bring me to the place of greater intimacy with you. Let my fellowship with you this year be deeper. Lord, make me strong spiritually. He says, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be here as your soul prospers. Your prosperity financially, materially, and physically has to do with your spiritual prosperity. Thank you, Father. Cause me to prosper spiritually. And consequently, help me to prosper financially. Help me to prosper physically in the name of Jesus. Prospering physically doesn't mean sickness will not come, but your faith will overcome them. <laughs> your faith will overcome them. They will disappear the same way they came. Thank you, Father. I want you to pray this morning and disallow anything that is troubling your life. I'm about to pray. And God confirms the word of his servants. He performs the counsel of his messenger. I want you to agree with me. It's a principle of the kingdom. If two of you shall agree as touching anything they ask, it shall be done of my father which is in heaven. Anything in your life that does not match up with the purpose of God, I want you to say, Lord, I stand on your word and I disallow this sickness, this pain, this trouble, this challenge, I disallow its work in my life. Whatsoever is troubling your life, de declare I disallow it in the name of Jesus. What is one thing you desire in your life? Allow it. Say, I allowed victory in this battle, in this challenge. Father, I allow breakthrough in this area of my life. Father, I allow 
robust health and healing right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Shakalaba. I disallow the enemy's intrusion in the life of my son, my child, in the name of Jesus Christ. I disallow this satanic battering that's going on in the name of Jesus. Whatever it is, maybe it's something in the life of your husband you want to disallow, something in the life of your wife. Whatsoever you allow will be allowed, whatsoever you disallow will be disallowed. And I stand with you right now. Everything you are disallowing in your life, I stand in the name of Jesus and I declare them disallowed. I declare them disallowed. That sickness is disallowed. That oppression is disallowed. That embarrassing situation is disallowed. It will go no further. In the name of Jesus, I command every intimidation to cease. Every harassment of the enemy to cease. In the name of Jesus, I command every malice against you to cease. In the name of Jesus, we stop all actions of the wicked against you. I command them to meet with frustration. We allow your healing. We allow robust health, well-being, victory, success, progress, achievement, well-being. All through this week and beyond. In the name of Jesus, all those things you have been allowed in your life, we allow them now in the name of Jesus. Every handwriting that is against you and contrary to you, we take them out of the way. We command them nailed to the cross. In the name of Jesus. I command every symptom of sickness to disappear. I command our pain disappear. Everything my father has not planted, I command them disappear. 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 Strangers shall fade away. They shall be afraid out of their close places. Every strength in your body. Every strength in your life. Every strength in your family. I command them, disappear. Fade away. Fade away. By the decree of the washers. I command them, fade away. Every evil that is plotted against your life this week. I command them to disappear. Fade away. You will walk through darkness in the light. Darkness will not comprehend you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. I want you to join me in the morning tomorrow. 